guys, welcome to another episode of the Mean Enough Podcast. I am Ace. This is RB3. And this is the podcast where we talk about your favorite film directors and the deeper meaning within their films. And this is a very special episode, RB3, because it is number 50. We hit 50. For the Mean Enough Podcast, we are coming up on the year mark, unless we've already hit the year mark. Have we hit the year mark? I have no idea, bro. I think it's around, because I know it was like late, late-ish September We got to think there's 52 weeks in a year. We're at 50 episodes. You lost me. <laughs> Man. skipped one week. You skipped one week. Actually, I think we're ahead of the... I don't know. Can you see last... Can you go episode one by possibility? Yeah, I can do that. Let me look it up real quick. Yeah. And yeah. while I look it up, RB3 is going to tell me all about his amazing weekend that he had. <laughs> amazing weekend. I mean... We were just talking about... Hip hop albums, which I think is kind of funny. Oh man! I was at the at the live Schmodown. Schmodown. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what the Schmodown is, it's a movie trivia. I think everybody's yeah. listening to this podcast. I know. To this, what but the is. still, I went to the Schmodown live, my very first Schmodown live. Hey! Um, I had a homie come up to me and tell me to tell you RB three that oh. you're wrong about Eminem, um, and that Eminem is an angel sent from above. She was whack. Kamikaze is whack. Kamikaze is incredible. Side of history. So. You can give us a hot take on that RB3. No, I mean, Kamikaze was mostly whack. But there's, I mean, you ain't saying shit on there. I, I like Joe Budden's response. You see Joe Budden. Uh, I'm still following Joe Budden, bro. <laughs> I, ride, I ride with Joe Budden. Ever Bunn's since he left Complex, bro. Yeah, oh, oh, I still rock, I still rock with Wade. Guess what? We left Complex, too, to a certain extent. No, no, not really, but we have nothing to do with Collider. But Collider left Complex, to a certain extent. Yeah. But hey. I yeah. support Joe Button and any. I try. Effort. I try to get a job at Complex. One of my homies was. Uh, one of my homies' homie was working there. I don't really. Huh? Could have been working with Natasha. I could have been working with Natasha. It would have yeah. been me and Natasha, bro. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's quite gorgeous. Um, September twenty sixth, twenty seventeen is our first episode. September twenty seventh. Twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Okay. So now so we, we are, are so, so close. close. We are two weeks away from. Uh, my two year anniversary. Two For weeks to one day. year anniversary. A one year anniversary. That's right. Yeah. So we, down fifty two. We actually have to hit fifty two episodes yeah. to get there. Wow. Yeah. It's, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, guys, this is episode number fifty, and we are very excited because it's going to be a very different episode because okay. we're going to be talking about film criticism. Hey. Which is a topic that is, I believe, very relevant, especially with TIFF happening over the weekend, and TIFF really making a point to point out certain things that they can change to evolve film criticism because it has evolved and we're going to talk about that but evolve it even more to a more progressive perspective and progressive I mean diverse I mean more people different kinds of people different kinds of backgrounds so I felt like it was an appropriate topic to talk about today film criticism we're going to get into it but before we do RB3 like we always do, we're going to go on last week's episode, which was about Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle. Someone that everyone wanted to hear about, or at least Danny we Boyle. thought everyone wanted to hear about Danny Boyle. Hey, man. But uh, we Danny went Boyle. through his filmography for the most part, except for the Leonardo DiCaprio movie. The Beach. Which we forgot. Um, My Shallow Graves. But a lot of people wanted uh, to do a Danny Boyle episode. Hey. So let's read one comment from Film Flam 945 says top shelf lads great breakdown of Slumdog thumbs up hey, hey there you go dog. that's Slumdog, Slumdog. Uh, Neil Varmer says 28 days later yeah. hey oh, wait 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 I gotta say something before we we were talking 28 days later 14 days ago when we did the Angley episode mm-hmm. I forgot to mention a very important point that I wrote down and told myself to mention I forgot then I wrote it down for next week and then I forgot to say it but I remember it now and it's the point that I made in the Spike Lee episode, and that Ang Lee was uh, was the assistant director to Spike Lee's first um, cop movie at, at graduate school, or one of Sp- Spike Lee's movies at NYU. Huh. So interesting. Spike Lee was the director of this movie called of, of this barbershop movie. I can't remember exactly what it was called. Yeah. And he directed while he was at NYU, and Ang Lee was also at NYU. Interesting. And he was the assistant director. Interesting. So the Lees have collaborated. The wow. Ang Lee and the Spike Lee. That's cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Fun fact from RB3. Fun fact. I, sorry, it's two weeks later, everybody, but I remember doing Hey, man. As long as you bring in that fun facts, that's all the that people care about. Hey. Christian Jacob says, where does Jake Gyllenhaal rank in your favorite actors list, and is he one of the best in the world? Funny you mentioned that, Christian Jacobs, because I love Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> I was going to say, I've, I've talked about it quite a bit to, to you, RB3, I think. Yeah, he's up there. He's in, 
I had a top three list for a long time. It changes as far as favorite actors, but for me it was Idris Elba as one of my favorite actors, mm. yeah. um, Michael Fassbender, and Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm. Not just favorite, but also like I believe one of the, some of the most talented actors working in Hollywood today. And obviously there's like legends, like there's like the Robert De Niro's and uh, you know, Robert Redford's and stuff like that. But for me, like when it comes to like leading man type actor, those three for me are like top notch. Do you have your favorites or a list or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I don't really have them in the list right now. I kind of have to like sit down and think about it. Because to me, there's a difference between actors that I really love and then actors that are in a lot of movies that I love too, you know? I think that's a, that would have to be a distinction that I have to like kind of sit down and make. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jay Jim Hall is one of the greats. I mean, I think Jay Jim Hall is probably one of the top top ones. And, you know, going back to Ang Lee conversation, right? Broke Back Mountain. Uh, and I mean, all all the films that um, you know, even in the Denis Villeneuve episode when we we're talking about how many uh, incredible things that oh, Jay Jim Hall has been in. So he's great in Prisoners too. Prisoners, Enemy. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah, just that's probably best, best filmographies. Yeah, Nightcrawler. Yeah, he was uh, great in the. I, I talked about it last time with the the Boston Bomber movie. He's oh, great in that it's too. Called Light or strong, right? Uh, stronger? stronger, stronger, yeah. He's great in that movie, and he's—you can tell. Like, I saw it with my family, and I was telling my family because my whole family is Jake Gyllenhaal fans. Yeah, and I was telling them, I'm like, yeah, he's trying for that Oscar. He's trying so hard, but I, I appreciated him trying because I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he got my vote for for an Oscar nomination, but yeah. he didn't get one, obviously. But yeah, he's—I I think he's one of the best, and he's a very transformative actor. And I'm excited to see him play, I guess, Mysterio in the next Spider-Man movie. Yeah. I guess um, I yeah, I know they've <laughs> the, they've wanted a a great actor for years. You know what I was thinking about? He was uh, originally supposed to play Spider Man too. That oh man. Sam Raimi's. Or That's he was going to replace Tobey Maguire, I think, in Spider Man too. Interesting. There you go, another fun fact from Mark Three. You're just full of facts today, man. Pew, pew, pew. Either way, what I was saying was, I know Spider Man has been looking for a super. I mean, they they're they're doing it now, but they've always wanted to make their villains to be incredible actors. Willem Dafoe, obviously, um, and if we got that with Michael Keaton as a, an incredible actor, and now with Jake Gyllenhaal. It's something that they've always wanted to do. Remember what the Matthew McConaughey rumors were coming out? Oh, for Mysterio? No, they wanted Matthew McConaughey to be the villain in a Spider-Man movie. Uh, I think this might be pre-MCU, I might, I might be, yeah, this uh, might be yeah. pre-MCU. Um, but Matthew McConaughey was, right when the reconnaissance was happening, they wanted him to be a Spider-Man villain. And everyone was like, oh, who can he be? But now it's Jake Gyllenhaal, man. He's a new Spider-Man villain. Yeah, unfortunately, they canceled the uh, Black Sable or Black Black Cat and Silver Sable movie, right? I thought they made that into two movies. Well, I mean, they canceled the, the original prayer, and Correct. the director's no longer doing it. That's not the only reason Correct. why I cared. It was because the director. Yeah, now they split um, it in two, and, and they're going to try to make it connect to... Venom. Yeah, I don't care. I don't care. And they canceled, with that? they canceled the Spike Lee one too, right? Yes. They canceled that one? I, no. No, 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 no. I don't think they did. You're, you're wrong. Well, no, no, no. They canceled one of them, and the one that they canceled was directed by a black woman. Yeah. I'm not okay with that. Yeah. And now they're doing two movies. But at least we got Venom and an Eminem Venom song. Oh, <laughs> god damn it. I hey. can't lie, dude. I texted you, right? <laughs> I immediately told you. I was like, dude, I'm cool with Eminem and all, but that Venom song... Wow. It's kind of kind of trash. She's wow. He's like venom, venom, something, venom, 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 venom. I'm wearing denim, denim. <laughs> what the fuck is this? Man? I was like, oh, washed out bars, bro. I could I could wash them in them in the rap battle. No man, I'm telling don't you, say that. I'm telling you, I could wash them. No way. I could wash them. No, you can't, bro. It's like, hey. I, I disagree hard. With that. <laughs> I can like, watch there, as someone who's actually been <laughs> in rap battles, and I'm not joking. I have been, <laughs> and I know it sounds so goofy, but it's true. You can't. <laughs> hey, I've done freestyle battles. I've done ciphers, and it's it's no joke. And and I'm telling you right now, Eminem is definitely one of the goats. Yeah, when nah. it comes to that, uh, he might be. But He's hey, listen, definitely one hey, of the somebody goats. clip out this clip. Send it to Eminem. Don't tell, send him, it to tell him to give me a 16, bro, because I'll give him a 32. Hey, man. He hated on Little Yachty, man. Yeah. See, now we're talking about Jake Gyllenhaal. Listen, Eminem, he went from 8 Mile to South Pole. Ooh. Ooh. Come I on. got these bars. <laughs> Dude, Eminem, kill you. <laughs> from Mars. Oh. 
I write cars. <laughs> <laughs> I play the guitar. <laughs> hey, dude, I'm telling you, man. You, you know. <laughs> Moving on. Um, David McCullough says, remember David McCullough? He's the one who recommended Danny Boyle to us. Hey. One of the many. All right, all right. He says, stoked that you guys read my comic. I was at the Schmodown last night. I introduced myself to Ace. I had no idea that you guys finally did this episode. Yeah, I met David. Hey, hey David. Uh, he came up to me and he's like, hey, Ace. And he says, I love your show. And I listened to the meaning of. And he's like, you got to do Danny Boyle. And I'm like, we already did Danny Boyle. Yeah. <laughs> Go listen to the episode. Hey. I told him. And sure enough, here he is. So shout out to David. Give yeah, us a round of applause to David. You get a special round of applause. I also want to give another yeah, shout out to uh, Sarah, who came up to me. Oh, yeah, Sarah. Uh, very nice. And she also is a fellow listener of the Meeting Enough podcast. Sarah, thank you for listening. So shout out to Sarah for being one of our great supporters. Yeah. And now, let's get into what this podcast is all about, and that is film criticism. Now, RB3, when you went into film school, this was actually one of your studies, correct? This yeah. was going to be your major study. Well, this is, yeah, this is what I'm studying right now, studying media studies at USC, top film school in the world, according to Hollywood Reporter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the major I'm in is cinema media studies. It used to be called critical studies, but they changed the name, I think, to incorporate, you know, more, um, more diversity. And it's not just about crit like being a critic, studying and being a critic. It's about getting a job throughout the different aspects of the cinematic arts. So, you you know, usually people who are cinema media studies majors, some go on to become, you know, directors, some become go on to become critics. Some become to, some go on to become agents or some become to be, you know, go on to be development people. It's just, you know, also the most hired major in the USC film school is cinema media studies. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, uh, but yeah, I, most of my major is concentrated on the theory, the theoretical, the criticism. I've had multiple classes with the title criticism <laughs> in it. So that's, uh, yeah. So for you, RB3, if I were to ask you, what do you think defines <coughs> film criticism, what would you say? Um, I think criticism, film criticism, film criticism, I think it's an amalgamation of context of perspective and I think it's also a little bit of you know I think it's a little you know context when I speak about context I'm talking about like historical context but it's also a part of what is around it in a, in a cinematic context too right what's coming out during that time you know because criticism really is you know that's almost as locked in time as, as, mu as much as the movies are and love themselves, you know. And we look at how old critics used to respond to things and how the changes have come, you know, and the way people looked at things um, from an objective level to a subjective level. Early on in criticism, for example, when it was just a silent age of cinema, they really only could engage in criticism from a spectacle standpoint because there was no sound. The stories were the stories in the early cinema were very basic, very elementary. So you know, it wasn't, but then as time goes on and academia starts to develop and also the production code had a lot to do with how people wrote and criticized movies too. But, you know, it's all of that, it's all those factors. And, and, and I think that's what's, um, I think that's what's important and, and cool about criticism is just how it develops over time and stuff like that. One of the, one of the origins, one of the aspects of the origin of film criticism has to be the defining factor between film as a commercial product and film as an art form. Yeah. I know the French wave was a huge part of that, but a lot of what film criticism originates from is looking at a film and saying, oh no, 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 this isn't just going to the cinema to see a train coming at me and screaming. Um, it's going to the cinema to actually view an art piece. Viewing film as art didn't happen right away, right? It happened uh, later on. Yeah. And with that came what all art comes, whether it be music, whether it be actual art pieces and paintings mm -hmm. or film, because it's an art form, yeah. comes the criticism of it and taste and quality and all those stuff starts to play into that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the origin, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it because when films first started, there was uh, not as movies, not the way we think of it now. 
is because they used to have vaudeville performances. The vaudeville is like really trashy theater, um, essentially. And then like they would figure out, they, once they figured out how to like make a projector and stuff, they'll just project it and like, you know, in between the breaks of like performers doing whatever. And then people realize like, oh, people are like actually coming to see the stupid cheesy, you know, movies or whatever, little short things that they're putting up. So then they started closing out vaudeville theaters and converting those into movie theaters. Um, and then, you know, very early on, it was very monopolized, very centralized. So a lot of times, even if it wasn't an independent movie, if it was like a studio built movie, because studios started to come out at like in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, when they really started building up. But if you own, if you're a studio back then, you could own the theaters, the studio, you know, you had, you had every branch of the production, the distribution and the exposition of it. All three of those were just owned by, you know, one person. So even the criticism would be owned, but it would be, be coming from a newspaper that was affiliated with the studio or something like that too. So, you know, it, it kind of changed a lot over time, but once, you know, you're right. It, was, it wasn't seen as art early on, but it, it kind of grew into its art form. I think a lot of it has to do with the academic writing that surrounded film at the time too. And we're really helped to distinguish it as his own individual art film. Yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about Black Klansman, and that movie kind of makes it a point to talk about Birth of a Nation, yeah. how much Birth of a Nation actually meant yeah. to the movie industry and to how people view movies. How, do, how much did that have a play in hand? Because I know that's another portion of our, of what recommendations became, where people actually started recommending movies where they're like, you have to see Birth of a Nation, this is crazy, it's dope. Mm -hmm. And, and obviously in the version of that period, yeah. but people were like actually recommending to go see this movie because yeah. it was so good. Mm -hmm. Like that's what, that was the term they were using to, you know, sell the movie. Yeah, well, I mean, not even good. I mean, the reason why we celebrate Breath of a Nation is because it introduced a lot of like the narrative devices mm -hmm. that cinema, you know, used now. It introduced the close-up. It introduced, you know, the whole idea of, you know, uh, cross, you know, not necessarily cross-cutting, but it's one of the ones that utilized the newer forms of cinema and started pushing narrative to a whole other level. That's, you know, and then, so that's why it's, it, it, was, it was so recognized as, you know, and why unfortunately, like, everybody has to study film school, because, like, it is what, you know, is the definition of the combination, because really, when you look at, you know, what was happening and, you know, foreign cinema and all that stuff, Birth of a Nation was really on, really early on in American film history, uh, and it kind of set the footprint for a lot of places outside the the, the cinema sphere in the U.S. as well. So it's just interesting that uh, this movie that's so problematic now, <laughs> to say the least, uh, racist as I would prefer to say, uh, but because it is so revolutionary and this filmmaking techniques, we have to regard it as so highly. Yeah, that's crazy. And yeah. obviously that, that scene, and I, I, I love that movie, by the way, Black Klansman. I, uh, I think yeah. it's very, I don't think it's getting as much attention as it should, mm -hmm. um, as far as award attention, but that scene is rough. That scene's crazy, watching that scene. But I know what eventually started taking off, you know, 60s, 70s, um, was newspapers. Newspapers were becoming sources for film criticism. Um, and each paper had their own film critic, and they were getting, you know, Boston Globe, uh, Chicago Tribune, New York Times, that kind of stuff. Where that's where you got your source of the star rating, or your source of is this movie good or not? Is it worth my time? It was kind of the newspaper, and that's kind of been the case forever, right? I mean, for not forever, but for still now. But eventually that wasn't always the case. We're gonna see now what, what happened to modern film criticism. But I don't know, it's interesting, right? Because we were talking beforehand about, um, geez, I already forget his name. Um, Roger Ebert? Yes, yeah. Roger Ebert. And the reputation he had as being the greatest film critic of all time, or at least the most recognizable film critic of all time. And what helped with that was that TV show he had with Siskel, Siskel and Ebert, where they basically broke down to the simplest terms, and that's kind of another part of film criticism, is relaying your opinion to the mass audience, okay. to a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Whether It's like watch, don't watch. That's the simple movie review that kind of became what it is now, right? Because we see it in newspaper articles as like this actual 
piece that you have to read and you have to digest and you have to consume and have to interpret as was it good, was it bad? Because not all film is easy to break down like that. And I think a lot of people are missing that nowadays, but a lot of that was that show, Cisco and Niebuhr, yeah. where, where they were told to say really quickly what the movie's about, what it does good, what it does bad, watch it, don't watch it. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, when you look at criticism just as a um, general form, as a general component of, of movies, it, you know, it all kind of, you know, it comes down from the uh, academia standpoint, right? Like, mm. at, um, when you're talking about back in the newspaper days, like in the 60s and 70s, you know, at that point, we're starting to get more um, ideas, you know, like we had um, one of the first pieces uh, that addressed uh, the ideas of adaptation in film was written in 1957, for example, you know, or published in 1957. Uh, you know, we have foreign, you know, foreign people who were um, putting together the theories that we all, that critics have begun to associating, auteur theory, you know, all these theories that were beginning to develop during that time. So then when it, so critics who study film and, 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 and know film like that, uh, you know, get those readings and, and get a broader understanding. Well, also the movies in them themselves were becoming less studio dependent. The studio system was breaking down. It was more independent, you know, not more independent. Yes, yeah, more independent, but it's more unique voices of filmmaking breaking out in the 60s and 70s. That's where we get like the Lucases, the Spielbergs, the Coppolas, all the, all the high stuff, you know what I mean? So, like, at that point, criticism was, was, you know, was looking at these movies, but also incorporating the film school. It was like the film school brats, as they say, of that generation was coming into film. There's also the film school brats coming into the criticism aspect of it. And we began, we began taking a lot more critical evaluation. We started moving away from just looking at the spectacle, moving away from just looking at, oh, is this entertaining? Is this wholehearted? What does the movie have to say? What does it do? What does it say about the artist? What does it reflect, you know? These are ideas that started becoming introduced. And I think once, you know, we started thinking on a more elevated level and as technology develops and the world starts being able to communicate with each other more and more, um, the world and the audience gets wiser to it too. So I think to the point that we get to the TV critics, you know, and, 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 and Ebert and Siskel era, you know, that's, that's at a point where movies are becoming mass products, you know, like they've always been mass products throughout their, you know, throughout their existence, but this is when you know, this is when the big, this is when, you know, Sony's buying Columbia Pictures. This is when Coca-Cola's buying, you know, this company. This is when literally everybody is, when all the conglomerates are starting to come into to the movie business. So um, TV networks are cashing in on that too. So they understand there's an initial market for people who enjoy criticism. So that's why they brought in a show like Sister and Neighbor, which it, you know, actually ended up influencing a lot of people too. Yeah, I mean, it's a good show. It's, it's definitely no, no takeaway nothing negative against them because for me I still think it's a it's a good idea to do that kind of show and it's kind of funny how nowadays obviously we're gonna get into that a little bit more because I have a section set up for it but how nowadays the replacement of that show is what YouTube right it's what we yeah. see on YouTube the schmoes yeah like the schmoes but that's kind of on TV that's where it started and there was I'm, I'm assuming there was a other few television shows dedicated to film criticism whether it be a short half an hour show whether it be anything else but I mean, I'm assuming there was quite a bit, but it, but for me, what what defines film criticism now? Let's get to modern times because I feel like that's what we know more. Um, it's kind of crazy. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but it's kind of nutty because now, talking 2018, we have the monster, not monster, but we have the craziness known as Rotten Tomatoes, where. Rotten Tomatoes developed a system, which is a great system, because it, it works, um, saying, how would you rate this movie? And based on that rating they take from the critic, they would say rotten and fresh. Whether it be one, through, one out of ten, whether it be one out of five, whether it be, you know, grades, A, a plus, B plus, C, whatever it is, they have a cutoff saying if it's below this amount, on your, the way you grade this movie, it's rotten. If it's above this amount, the way you, even if it's like a point above it, it's like a barely passing grade, we're going to give it a fresh. And from there, we're going to 
take all the critics, put them all in, you know, a system of website, and say how many percentage of critics liked or didn't like this movie. So that's how we're going to place it, and from there we have a rating system of percentage. So we see ratings like 89%, 92%, 54%, 43%. That is the amount of critics who gave it a passing score. It could be A, it could be C+, plus. like it could be barely passing or it could be amazing. And, and you don't know that unless you click on the critic and you read what they're actually saying. But honestly, RB3, most people don't do that. And in fact, most people see that rating system as all the critics agree that this movie gets an A+. This movie gets a 95. Like, oh, 95, oh, that means it's an amazing movie. That All the critics said it's an A+, movie. And it's like, that's not the case at all. And it's crazy how, I know it's always said on any movie YouTube channel, but it's true, or any movie podcast, as a person who talks to people who aren't into as into movies as much as I am or you are, most people still think that means that movie got a 92%. That's the grade they get. And that's what they see, or it got a 43%. And it's like, well, that, oh, that movie's terrible. I'm not gonna see it. That's how people read Rotten Tomatoes. And that's the biggest problem with the website. It's not them, it's the audience that they're reaching out to. The people who actually go on the website go on there, read the rating, and assume, oh, that's the rating they gave it. It must mean it's a bad movie, I'm not gonna watch the movie. Where, in reality, that's not what it's saying at all. Yeah, I mean, I know what, she, I know what we want, like, Ron Tomatoes to do about it, you know what I mean? Like, they can. I mean, yeah. it's literally, all you have to do is teach your audience. What you have to do is fucking use Metacritic, people! Ladies and gentlemen, I've been saying this for years! I still like Ron Tomatoes. <laughs> now, fuck Ron Tomatoes. No, I'm just kidding, I love Ron Tomatoes. I love Ron Tomatoes. I actually love Ron Tomatoes. Where's my fresh and rotten? Did I bring that? Oh, yeah, I didn't bring, yeah. yeah. bring it. Um... Man, I you love know, Rotten Tomatoes. You know what people should do, RB3? Yeah. And I've said this to my brother, I've said this to friends of mine, I've said this to everyone. Go read critics' reviews. Mm. Go read a few critics. Pick a few. Uh, how do you pick them? Ask people for recommendations. Who do you recommend as a film critic? Who should I read? Read some reviews on the Rotten Tomatoes websites, because they give you a link to it. So you can actually go on Rotten Tomatoes, scroll through some reviews, and just click on a name or click on an outlet that you think is compelling and that you think might have some good information, and that'll give you a different opinion. I think that's the best thing that people should do, is like read four or five reviews from one of the critics from Rotten Tomatoes. Well, I think, you know, when we talk about the history, going back to history a little bit, back in the day, the critics had a lot of power in determining, uh, you know, what, what, you know, what a movie made, how much a movie in fact, impacted the audience, you know what I mean? Because back in the day, uh, back in the early, early cinema, that was the only way people got recommendations for movies was reading it through the newspaper, was reading it through the critics, or reading it through the showtimes or whatever, the recommendations, you know? Um, now as time goes on, the word of mouth matters a lot more because people are able to communicate a lot better, the fan scores matter a lot more, so everything's a lot more accessible. Um, now if you're asking me what I prefer, but then, you know, critics also have a lot of power today, too, because we see the Rotten Tomato score having a very direct effect on um, how, how a movie performs or doesn't perform. Um, but that being said, I mean, I think, you know, we can only ask for the aggravator to do so much. I feel like the audience has to wisen up to a certain extent when it comes to Rotten Tomatoes, because um, I feel like Rotten Tomatoes does more net good than net bad for the film community. Um, so that's that's just why that's just why I think. The, yeah, I mean the problem is the vast majority. I can't. I'm making assumptions, but if I'm making assumptions, there's a ton of a ton of old people who love watching movies. Yeah, love it. They adore Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. They base everything on Rotten Tomatoes. The problem is a lot of them. I'm not saying all. Still read it like I just told you, saying, "Oh, it's a 92. Oh, that means it's an amazing movie. I'm gonna go watch it. Or oh, I got a 26 percent. Oh, I'm not gonna watch that movie." 26% means it's F. No, it only means 26% didn't give it the grade that they, the Rotten Tomatoes was looking for as far as thumbs up or thumbs down. You know what I'm saying? Like, if it got like a 4.5 out of 10, um, it's considered rotten, but it's barely rotten, considering that term, or a 5 out of 10. You know, it's rotten, but it's not as rotten. Um, so there is, you know, 
little wrinkles in there that people don't really take in because that's not what they want to do. They don't want to read positive or negative. Have you read a review RB3 that says, good, 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 bad, 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 make up your own mind? Mm. This is everything that's good in the movie. This is every I've read a ton of those reviews, and I can't lie. Part of me is like, I appreciate it, and part of me is like, what do you, then what? <laughs> what do you want me to do with this information? And it's kind of frustrating as a movie-going audience member that I am as a movie fan, because I was like, well, tell me, is it good or not? Yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. I've read reviews like that where I'm like, what are you trying to say though? Like, yeah, is it dope? Because that's, that's my that's that's one of my biggest problems with like, and that's why you really have to find a critic. But that's like. nuance though. But but that's, that's nuance. Nuance, that's is, important. nuance is important. I do like a critic that can that is clearly like if, and I think that's what made Roger Ebert so great because he was such a brilliant writer that when you read his reviews, even though they're very nuanced, very layered, it went over the good, the bad, the positive, and the negative. It was still very very clear what he ended up lining with the movie, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it was just clear through the tone. Just, you know, sometimes it was a little more snarkier, which was a little funnier, but would also mean the movie's pretty much bad or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like that, that's what, you know, to me, so for me, like, I always have a hard time with critics who write very detailed think pieces on the positive and negatives, but I have no idea where they stand on it, you know what I mean? And that frustrates me more than not reading the review at all. That frustrates me more, you know, because, I really appreciate understanding. And I think that's what criticism is to a certain extent, is lending your own perspective to uh, your viewing experience. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that is overlooked when it comes to criticism is how personal um, experiences, how, uh, how, how, how an individual critic's life uh, choices or experiences or even movie watches it influences their opinions on a particular movie. 100%. That literally brought me to my next point that I have outlined here is the fact that backgrounds affect perspective. My life, my background, what I went through in life on, you know, as long as I've lived, which is not as long as some other people, um, what I know as far as film knowledge plays into that, but my background plays more into it. My emotions play more into it, and people have different backgrounds. <laughs> RB3, that's yeah. the problem. If I say this movie's, if I if I tell uh, a 67 year old grandma living in Georgia that Shape of Water is a really good movie, you see what I'm saying? Right. She she's probably not going to get what a 28 year old living in Los Angeles who dealt with some stuff in the past is going to get from Shape of Water. Yeah. She, Stuff like that is what I, I get, I don't get frustrated with it, but I, I just feel like it's a little bit, like you said, it's not, people don't pay enough attention to it. Yeah. Your background is going to play a big factor, your age, your demographic, your, your religious views, whatever it may be, is going to play a massive factor on how you view a movie, whether positively or negatively. And I think a lot of people don't get that. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a problem with Hollywood in general and with film criticism. But that's a problem with who we have doing these, you know, reviews and, and, and being film critics. And that's a problem that a lot of people are starting now to shine a spotlight on it. Because I feel like if we have the same people, the same type of people, demographic, same age range, review all these movies, then you're going to get the exact same opinions. We need to diversify this on every level, on an age level, on a demographic level, on, on background level, uh, because that is when you start to get a perspective that people can start to appreciate a little bit more. And it's not necessarily like, if I'm a Mexican dude living in LA, I have to read a review from a Mexican dude living in LA. Like, that's not what I'm trying to say. Of course, read everyone else's reviews. But what I'm trying to say is, people making the decisions of what is good and what is bad if they're all the same people, you're going to start to see a pattern of what they're seeing. And that might not necessarily reflect your views and your perspective when you watch a film. And, and it, that, it, to me, is so important because it, it literally can impact, like you said, box office and success of a movie and quality of a movie. Because I really, I, I, I insist that I insist so much, your personal baggage Whatever you take inside a movie is going to make a bigger difference 
than the quality and acting, the quality in the shots, and the quality in everything else. That is the biggest thing that's going to take you in. And that's why we're seeing such a massive success, for the most part, with superhero movies. Because a lot of people start to re relate nostalgia with quality. And do you feel, RB3, like that's a, 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 a negative thing that should be kind of weeded out? Because nowadays we're getting shows like Stranger Things or other reboots and remakes or retellings of the same stories that 37-year-olds loved as a kid and now they're making reviews on it and they say they love it again because it reminded them of what they felt as a kid. How nostalgia is starting to become film criticism itself. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's just always going to happen, though. You know, like there's always going to be people longing for it. But I think it's I think it's it's a different way. Like I think if you know, I think if in ten years if you and me are still doing film criticism, we're going to look more towards how movies in the two thousands were made. Like how movies were like a little more commercially viable, but still like you know, pretty you know. Because I think there's always a wave. I think we have a wave, and I I've always said this. I think every thirty years. We're just going to keep going through the same shit. Like, you know, like the 50s is going to turn into the 80s, it's going to turn into the 2010s. Uh, you know, this all the same homogenized, regard, you know, recycled bullshit that, that every, you know, we revolves to 30 years before in the 1920s. That's just like, oh, here's the stories that we're telling about the classic Americana, the lifestyle that we have to live at home. You know, that's the same shit. But then, you know, like, well, when we get to like the, 1930s or the 1960s and 1990s that 30 year cycle that's some hard shit that's when we get the citizen canes that's when we get the the you know that's when we get the the the, the uh what's that one with dustin hoffman not dustin hoffman yeah dustin hoffman jack nicholson uh easy rider easy rider we get that type of shit in, in the 60s we get pop fiction in the 90s you know and in the two, and in the forties we get Casablanca. In the seventies we get you know. It's because the uh, people make the movies. Just, we we get tired of the same shit eventually. But we'll get tired of the same shit, and then the critics are going to get tired of seeing the same shit. But it's because the people making the movies are are from from those generations. So yeah, making yeah. callbacks to their generation. Yeah. I just saw the trailer for a movie called Mid Nineties. Yeah. And I think it's directed Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. Yeah. Where it's it, I was like yeah mid. Now come the 90s. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to head right into that 90s. Yeah, now it's going to be the 90s, and then it's going to be the 2000s. Every, everything's like going to be everything's gonna be clueless. I'm going to be like 38 <laughs> or 40 yeah. in like, I don't know, 2028 20, or 2032 or something like that. And I'm going to make movies about my era. You bet your ass I am, RB3, yeah. because that's my era. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to talk about like 1999 and stuff like that, because that's where, that's my nostalgia. That's my connection, whereas other people who are making movies nowadays have that connection to the 80s, and people nowadays who are reviewing movies have that connection to the 80s. I will never understand people, well, I, I will understand, but it's frustrating to talk to people, RB3. People that we are familiar with, and we have conversations with, and I say stuff like, I like the prequels, and they look at me <laughs> like I'm insane. We don't, they don't realize that when they say stuff like, I like, I don't know, Gremlins 2, or some shit movie. That's, <laughs> Gremlins 2 is hard. Or, uh, whatever it is. Whatever nostalgic piece of shit they like. Yeah. Because there's a lot of nostalgic 80s shit. Oh, it's shit. It's I'm telling you. They're like, oh, that movie's awesome. I'm like, that movie's shit. I'm telling you right now, it's shit. You think it's awesome because you grew up on that movie and you saw it like 20 times as a kid. That's why I think the prequels are awesome too because I have that nostalgic memory with the prequels and I thought they were dope. So for me, it's like... Come on, man, we gotta meet in the middle somewhere where we yeah. start to understand that maybe I do like this movie simply because of nostalgia. Maybe I do like this movie because I relate it to my childhood or to having a better life and not having the adult responsibilities that I currently have now. That is a lot, that is a huge part of, of movie criticism, a huge part of movie reviews itself. Yeah. Is what we relate our personal background with this certain movie and how we treasure movies that are terrible mm -hmm. because they remind us of happier times yeah. as a kid or something like that. Yeah, no, and I think that's the most, uh, well, I mean, again, it's, it's all based on experiences and I think that, you know, um, but if, 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 and I think that's where I've always felt that my position has always come from is that I feel like you're so influenced by what you watch as a kid, you know, I, I always go back to saying, they say, 
they say uh, they say garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you watch a bunch of garbage, you're gonna make a bunch of garbage, or you're gonna talk about a bunch of garbage. You know what I mean? So I, I always felt very. I always I felt and still feel very passionately about if you give, you know, people who are poor or people from lower income communities or people of color or people who, from marginalized groups more opportunity to see movies, we will you know we will see a new. Form, we will see a lot better stuff happening in the world, like not just in, in the context of movies, just in general. Uh, <clears throat> I think people will be a lot more understanding of other perspectives. Because I remember one of, uh, you know, when Bibiani came on the show, no show, uh, episode 283, and they were talking about like film criticism in general. And what he was saying is that, like, you know, you know, and I, I, I felt very moved by it is that, you know, a lot, you know, for me and well, for Bibiani, he was saying, but I, I connected to it as well. He said, you know, I don't go to the movies to watch myself on screen. I go to the movies to watch, you know, other perspectives, other other worlds, other stories, right? And I think that's very much why I go to the movies. I think that's why, I think if people, the more movies you watch, just the more universally um, generous you become as a person, I think. You know what I mean? Sure. More universally, you're able to connect on the people on a more empathetic level, I think, than if you were just a non-movie goer. So I don't know. So I think that's why I say... I say yes, movie pass. Yet yes, Netflix have always had you know the consistent position of give more people movies, and I think that's why. That's Dude, very here's here's my question to you, RB3, and it's a question that I've been thinking about pretty much all day. Is the is the counter to that argument? No, nothing mm -hmm. against Bibiani, but the, but the concept of like, well, what if I am a black guy who has a lot of opinions on movies? And I can write a review just as good as Bibiani can on this movie. And instead of saying it's different than me, it's the same as me. What if what if, you're saying now? I'm mean, obviously I'm playing devil's advocate, but right. I'm saying like if they make like this crazy cool Mexican movie and they get a 47 year old white guy to review it because it's a different perspective from him, I feel kind of left out because I'm like, wait a minute, what about my perspective? This is talking about my childhood, not your childhood. Shouldn't I have something to say about it too? Right. It's, well, it's it's the, it's the idea of diversifying not just the movies, how the movies are getting more and more diverse, but the film critics remain to be the same old white dudes. It, it just is old white dudes. Yeah, well, old, I think, older white dudes. Well, I think I think what Bibi, I think Bibiani in that case was referring to like wasn't referring to like reading criticism. I think he was referring to like seeing diversity on screen. You know. Well, that's what I'm saying. What, what, what I'm saying is is there's there's no question that we're finally getting to a place. Or we're starting to see different types of people in front of the camera. The problem is the people talking about these movies, the people discussing them, the people who are the flag bearers, the people who give you your perspective on how to view a movie, who are film critics, whether that be written reviews or video reviews, are the same. We're seeing Sterling K. Brown, we're seeing Daniel Kaluuya, we're seeing all these people come out and, and, and Jordan Peele, Spike Lee, killing it. And I read 20 reviews, and all 20 of them are 52-year-old white dudes. Like, you don't see a problem with I do. I personally feel like, wait a minute, I, I, I thought we could have both. Why is one, one thing being like, cool, it's a black movie. I'm a white guy, and I'm going to say, cool to the black movie, because I don't want to be seen as racist. You, know, so you see what I'm saying? Like, that's a, I think that's something that people are kind of ignoring. Yeah. We're... we're, we're if we start to see more diversification, which I'm going to talk about that too, because I, I, I feel like there's a problem too with people talking about diversity. Because diversity is not, there's a great, 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 great video on college humor um, where they make a skit about it and they talk about diversity and it's clutch, it's dope. Because they literally talk about how a host comes out and they talk about diversity like a fashion trend. And it's like a fashion host, like, diversity is in this summer because it's so cool. And then she talks to experts who are actual, like, di like activists and stuff. And they say, no, diversity isn't getting a black guy to review a black film. Diversity isn't getting a Mexican guy to talk about a Mexican movie. Diversity is, within itself, the world. It's a reflection of reality. It's a reflection of society. It's a reflection of what we see now in America or in the world. The fact is... There is a lot of Mexican people living here. There is a lot of, of black people living here, Asian people, whatever it may be. Let's have that same reflection reflect into the Hollywood industry, into the people making movies, the people talking about movies, the people who are directing and acting and reviewing these movies. Let's have an accurate representation of 
the diversity we see in real life, not fakeness, not something, the, oh, they're pushing their agenda. It's no push agenda. It's what you walk out your door and see. You just refuse to see it and you ignore it and you just want to see your perspective. That is what diversity is. And I feel like we get that and we're starting to see that a little bit more because I do feel like where the Mexicans at and where the Latinos at. I've, I've said that for years and I still insist that there's no Latino movies. There's no Latino who are front leading men. You know, maybe Oscar Isaac and that's kind of it. Um, so I personally feel like we're still way behind. And considering that in 2050, Latinos are going to be part of the majority of the, of the U.S. I mean, come on. We're getting more and more populated inside America. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is diversity in film, diversity behind the camera of the people talking about the film. And to be honest, every three, I don't see that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good efforts to push uh, for more diversity in film criticism. I know like you mentioned Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, they started a mandate where they're requesting a minimum, what was it, like 25% of the people of color um, come, come out there and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also, uh, um, and there's also with Black Plasma. The reason I got to see that was because, uh, you know, Jordan, Jordan Pills Production Company along with, uh, you know, Matthew A. Cherry from, from Twitter, I don't really know him. I guess he used to play football, or he used to play football, and now he's a film director, but I just know him from Twitter, honestly. He's probably a great producer. He produced Black Pants, so I shouldn't talk about it like that. But anyway, he put out a call where he was like, hey, if you are a uh, person of color critic, email me and we'll get you into Black Plasma. So I did it, and I actually did get into that. So uh, salute to them. So they're, you know, people are making, you know, people are trying to make the effort and grow out. And I think, you know, you, you got to look at the roots, right? Like, I go to film school. Like, I go to film school. And I'm a cinema media studies major, and like no joke, I'm if if it's a lecture class of 300, there might be four black people in there. Four. Can I follow up with you? Yeah. I've worked in the industry for four years in a television production company. There was a we had I believe 56 employees. I was the only non-white person there. I'm not joking. Yeah. And there was three white women. It's, it's real. Like when you work in the industry, when you actually work in the industry, grips, PAs, producers, cameramen, all white. Yeah. All white. Awesome. And, it, and it's cool. I love, like, this is my family. We're cool. I love, I love working with them. They're the coolest people ever. And they're very aware. They're self-aware of what's, what it is. But that, that's hard, man. That goes hard. I don't know if, if, if it's the same thing for you, what you just said. Yeah. Well, again, you got to start at the roots, right? And I, again, I think that's why... You know, honestly, maybe this is a little too extreme, but maybe, maybe I gotta say it. Maybe the government should start letting people watch free movies, man. God damn it! Nah, well, here's kind of how here's my here's my follow up <laughs> to you into my next conversation. The difference between blockbusters and art house films, and 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 one of my topics of conversation is that the movies that we're seeing, and 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 you may disagree with me, but the movies that we're seeing succeed in diversifying their on screen presence are small, independent movies. That's just the case. I agree, I agree. Movies I agree like, with that for the most part. Movies like Moonlight, movies like Get Out, movies like um, Sorry to Bother You, movies like, those are the kind of movies that are getting more and more diverse, are smaller, independent, art house movies that only play in a few select cities and a few select cinemas. Let me talk about Sorry to Bother You. We saw it together, and I had a lot to say, RB3, about Sorry to Bother You, because the irony of Boots Riley making this movie and, 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 and just stamping it like black, black, Lakeith, Stanfield Lee, Tessa Thompson Lee, two black leads, let's go. And the irony that I, you and I sat in an audience that, no joke, because walking out, I saw them, I think you went to the bathroom and I saw all of them walking out, it was like 98% white. There was like, I think we saw a few black people and that's it. Yeah. And the irony that Boots, Boots Riley is like, yo, black people, we're gonna make this, and I told you after the film, I'm like, are black people really gonna like this film? Yeah. And you wouldn't you say so. And you say you don't think so. so. Yeah. Like that's the, that's the irony that we're we're saying, yeah, this is cool. And the people watching the movies are only art house movies, and the movies that black people actually like are are not really being paid attention to. Yeah. I will say, I think young black people like. Uh, sorry, sorry to bother you. Okay. Because I actually did end up talking to somebody who's not a movie fan but is black yeah. and saw so Sorry to Bother You, and they really enjoyed it. Yeah. But then, like, 
they were young too. So I think if you're like under twenty, I was gonna say like uh, under thirty. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna talk about something else. Yeah, you're okay. gonna pull up Grace Randolph and say, I, I, "There was an Asian man who said he liked it outside uh, no, of the theater." Doing, I guess that means Asians I'm love it. Not, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Um, oh, but shit. you know, I can go off on that yeah. on that conversation, which yeah. I'm not going to do, guys. Yeah, um, um, but uh, but you know, but, but what I'm saying, Blackbusters are doing pretty good too, though. I feel like th- that's Panther, true. I agree with you, Black Panther. But I feel like Black Crazy Panther, Rich Asians, Crazy Rich Asians. I agree with that. But but the problem is like the idea always goes back to money, 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 access, movie access, getting people to see these movies, and then when they see them to see if they actually like these kind of movies. If you make a Latino film, do Latinos actually like this movie? The irony that a movie like Shape of Water was praised because of Guillermo del Toro, and the irony that if you show this to most Latinos, most Latinos are gonna be like, (coughs) this fish-loving movie is kind of weird. I do not like it, I guarantee it. Like, most Latinos would not like Shape of Water. I know that for a fact. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that, you know, it's like, yo, Mexican, let's go. And it's like, mm, <laughs> Mexicans wouldn't really like this movie <laughs> to begin with. Um, because it's an art house, independent, very specific, well, see, stylistic movie. That's why we need to have more accessibility to these movies so people who are young and people who are black or Latin, if you're black and watching Sorry to Bother You, you know, you should be able to watch that and, and, and be able to have access to that instead of just letting these white motherfuckers see it. You know what I mean? Instead of just having the bougie, upper class, arc like Hollywood crowd be allowed to see a pro-black, pro-union, pro-worker movie. Um, who, who are the people? Because they have no effect on it. They have no... People who, who watched Sorry to Bother You that night when we watched it have no connection yeah. to being a hard worker. And they loved it. Though. Yeah. They were they, like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. Yeah. yeah. And, but that's kind of my problem is the fact that we're seeing all these super duper rich because they're rich um white people see these movies and love these movies and then just proclaim that they love it but the problem is the people who are making it the black filmmakers the black leads like lakeith mm-hmm. like boots riley talking about how this is movie is going to be like all of, like you said well pro worker pro black how many black people saw this movie i guarantee you if there was a demo chart you know it'd be pretty low considering how many white people so but then so, but then again that's what i'm saying like if if uh, black panther to me is is the one and i'm sorry to interrupt yeah. black panther to me is the one that that is starting to take that flag but how many people on twitter and on other stuff that i follow and i can tell you a personal story but on twitter that you saw were buying tickets for young people to see this movie because they still couldn't afford to see black panther yeah exactly yeah exactly these are marginalized communities and that's why I was, that's exactly what I was getting to is that if you know movie movie pass gave people that op- option you know yeah. kind of failed but whatever uh, you know Netflix is still continuing to give people the ability the accessibility to explore for a fair cool price shit. yeah for a fair, and I think that's yeah. why, and I think more people are becoming more film literate because of Netflix that's I think it. there's a lot of people who are really who really know a lot more about film and television as solely because of netflix well one thing i wanted to say that i, I just think it's a funny story um my my church my church bought out like dozens and dozens of theaters for weeks for kids in 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 communities here in la that are really poor communities to see black panther mm-hmm. um and I, as soon as my our pastor said that we were like <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> this church is dope. <laughs> that's nice. And that's why I love my church because, and he told us, he's like, oh yeah, we're, what we want to do is we want to get these black kids being able to see an awesome black kick ass character. And we ask every single one of them, like, you know, have you seen this movie? And all of them said no. Like, the irony that, like, all these kids want to see this movie and they're not able to is what our pastor was telling us. So we're gonna give them that chance, and then we started like passing buckets and going, "Yo, this is crazy." Yeah. But but it's yeah. Crazy. When I make the same point on Twitter, motherfuckers is like, "Oh, you're invalidating credit to the wall. Oh no, dude. Yeah, and there's there's oh it, yeah. We we went in, and he and he went in to tell us like this is this is still the kind of Christian love that we're supposed to show as Christians, and that that's like because very people are very specific on where my money is going in church. And the fact that he was like, "Oh no, this is Christ like." to the nth degree, man. This is super Christ-like. And when he told us that, we were like, yeah, it's, it's kind of true. Um, but that's my thing, too, is the audience relating to that factor of who's making these movies. 
when you talked about film literate, I want to talk to you, RB3, real quick about taste. Do you think taste is real? Taste in films is real. Do you think that's real or do you think that's fake? There's so many people nowadays in 2018, RB3, who on every YouTube channel you're going to talk about, or on any film website review, and I'm pretty sure you have the same opinion, but it's that. It's that everyone has a different opinion. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that some movies just are trash? And it's not like, well, in my perspective, this movie is greatness because of this scene, this scene, this scene. Do you think there's an actual thing is like, you have bad taste in movies, you have good taste in movies. You know when a good movie is good and when a bad movie is bad. Um, well, no, I think, yeah, I think there's definitely... Because I do believe, there, there's, I, I'm, a, I'm a snob, dude. I, I totally believe, like, your movie opinions are trash, bro. <laughs> like, I straight up have told you personally yeah. about certain people that I'm like, their opinions are kind of trash. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, 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 I mean, you know, I, there, there are some, there are some, there, you could definitely, I think there's a, there's a little more objectivity to people. Well, that's the thing. Movies are subjective kind of argument where right. I, I highly disagree. I, I think there's movies that are bad. Where it's like, well, not, no movie is bad. It's like, yeah, there, there is bad movies. <laughs> yeah. I've seen some, and they're just objectively bad. Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's ways, I mean, you know, I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely movies that are objectively bad that I like, you know what I mean? Agreed. There's definitely, Same. there's definitely movies that are not, you know, because there's, there's a certain way to look at ob a movie objectively, right? If you, you know, you could, you know, there's, yeah, movies are subjective, but you could, Objectively speaking, you could count the number of cuts in a movie. Objectively speaking, you could count how long it take last or if something's overexposed. That's but since the vast true. majority have that knowledge of objectivity, uh, the vast majority of the ma I'm talking about people who go see Transformers yeah. and love Transformers and don't realize this is a trash movie. You're watching trash because they're not film literate, like you said. They don't know what's an objectively bad movie. Bad acting, bad lighting, too many cuts, uh, jerky camera movement, story. Uh, plot holes, uh, um, decisions from logical decisions from characters, like actual things that go into a cohesive, good movie. Yeah. Do the do the ma vast majority of movie going audiences know those things? Are you three? No. Well, no. I think inherently, some to some extent, to some extent they'll know. To 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 the base to the most basic level, people know what a bad story is. Okay. To the most basic level, I definitely think that. If there's a movie like The Snowman, I didn't see a snowman, so I don't really know like how bad it is. But I think objectively speaking, the critics and the audiences both agree like this is a bad movie. Well, here it is too. <laughs> I think a part of it too is genre. A part of it too is based on what you're paying to see. Yeah. Um, let me give you an example that literally just happened over the weekend. The Nun currently oh, has shit. a 26% of raw I saw that shit. The Nun made bonkers money over the weekend in box office. I saw it. it made 53 million, which is huge. As soon as I saw that number, I was like, 53 million. And then I remembered, if I'm a random guy who watches movies sometimes, right? Just a, a, a regular general movie going audience who only watches movies a few times a year. And I see the trailers for the Scary Nun movie, you bet your ass I'm going to take my girlfriend to see that Scary Nun movie. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't care if it's a 20% of Rotten Tomatoes. I'm still going to go see that Scary Nun movie because I want to get scared by a Scary Nun. <laughs> like, the simple math that takes place between you're not really going in for a quality story when it comes to something like The Nun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I saw The Nun and it wasn't a good movie, but... I mean, I don't, you see, that's the thing, I don't really get scared by horror movies all that much, so like... Yeah, not me, I'm me. the chicken, I, I get yeah. scared over everything. You see, now, I gotta see Hereditary. Hereditary is different, though. See, but you're, yeah. Because I don't even think Hereditary is more scary than it is disturbing. It's one of those horror movies that are just disturbing. That's like the best word to use to describe Hereditary. It yeah. hurts. Yeah, it hurts, RB3. I figured it out. It still I'm, hurts. I'm gonna get around watching it, but my, the larger point I was making is that uh, you know, those movies tend, you know, the, the Nun, for example, did very well. I saw it in an urban theater, uh, uh, Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Theater, uh, and it's, you know, all, all mostly black, most Latino audiences, well, and that's they what up horror movies, you know what Oh, I mean? so, man, I was going to say, like, that's the thing that, that, that I've been saying for years, and it's one of those statements that a lot of people don't understand unless you live, like, in a city like L.A. Mm -hmm. Latinos love horror movies we yeah. adore horror movies you have no idea how many crap horror movies came out last year 
and I would go by the theater, and everyone walking out was Mexican. <laughs> it's because we love horror movies, man. Like, how many people... Like, I think I actually saw the demo charts, I don't remember them, but of IT, of last year, yeah. it was a huge Latino-based market. And the fact that it was made by a Latino director, too, played a huge hand. But like you said, dude, you saw The Nun. How many Mexicans went to see The Nun? Yeah, a right. shit ton of Mexicans went to see The Nun. I know that for a fact. Like, that's the most Mexican type. There was like a Mexican, it was like a Mexican production, right? Like, it was actually Mexican actors and... and, and, and no, 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 I don't Oh, I, I, I think so. I, I think it was because it's the most like Catholic, Catholicism. Catholic Catholicism, and like as an actual Latino kid, if you're raised in Catholicism, hell yeah, you're afraid of a scary nun. That's like the most Mexican thing that I know, and I guarantee that's played a huge hand in the box office of the nun was the Latino market. But like you said, yeah, they don't care. They just want to see a scary movie. Yeah, yeah, um, but no, I think definitely. So I, I'm hoping that one day. We get we get we get put a little money back into the school system. We can start film classes in urban communities. Uh, you know what I mean? Like get you know, Compton High needs a little little couple film classes. You know what I mean? Get get some classes out there in Detroit, let uh, the South Side Chicago. Let people have a little outlet for you know doing bad you know doing stupid shit. Let them watch a couple movies and boom, you have a, probably a whole new generation. Because I feel like you know it. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough when the whole idea of being inclusive when it comes to criticism, you know, like, like I, I definitely want, like, like when you're talking about how there's 57 white guys, you know, I, 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 I want to see more black people get those spots. Um, I also want more black critics to like be uh, to be responsible and seeing more movies as well too because I think there's a lot of people who are you know not just black critics but I think pe you know people people of color who haven't had the same opportunities to watch the same amount of movies the same kind of movies that I would be getting from that that a critic of somebody who is an older white guy who's had the opportunity to see a bunch of movies who had the opportunity to go to the independent theater and see this French 1933 1983 you know French movie or whatever and they have this is saying you know a lot of people just don't have the opportunity to get that and I want that to happen and then I want to see I want I want to see a whole wave of young people of color watching a shit ton of movies and then those people becoming critics Yes, I mean that's the thing that people don't understand is the fact that a lot of it comes from their backgrounds, well, right? Oh, privilege. Yes. It's all about privilege. Privilege. The privilege to oh, you haven't seen these movies? Yes. I haven't had the privilege to see these movies, exactly. you asshole. Yes. Like people don't understand. Like I'm not a a rich white dude who went to like a super cool film school that mm -hmm. was paid by their parents mm -hmm. to see all these dope ass mm -hmm. movies, you mm -hmm. douche. Like that's uh, people don't get that, and I've I've heard that so many times. Like, oh, have you not seen these movies? Well, maybe because one, it's not in my generation, and two, I I did I don't have that opportunity, man. Like I didn't grow up with the same background that you did, and I and I don't think people understand that kind of definition of film critic is like saying, well, you how could if you not seen that, you can't you can't be a film critic, man. It's like, well, that's a different background. You yeah. that's discriminating against what I've grown up with. And that, I think that's a huge factor that a lot of people don't pay attention to, which is why we still have, what is it, 88% white male critics? Like, it's a crazy number. Like, and, and then even the female critics, sorry, it's all white women too. Like, I mean, when, when you start, and I'm, I know I'm gonna get a lot of shit for this, but when you start waving the diversity flag and say, look how diverse we are because we hired 20 white women, I'm sorry, you're not. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just being honest. I, yeah. You're not. You're just not. When 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 that starts to happen to me, I also feel like it's just not the same, man. We, we women of color is, is a very 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 different standard. They're getting discriminated on two fronts. Yeah, and and it's something that a lot of people. Uh, for me, like I forget who I was watching that said it best. When you when you pan to a to an office room and says, "Look how diverse we are," by saying, "There's look, we hired twenty white women." It's like well, you're not diverse. You just hired twenty white women. Who have the same background and who all have the same careers and who all went to the same school and got paid for. Like, it's not. That's not diversity. I'm sorry. It just isn't. Like, of course we need more women. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, like, if you really want to diversify certain things, get people from different backgrounds. Get people from different demographics. That's diversity. Because it's a appropriate reflection on reality. Not the same neighborhood that we've all grown up in. Like, that to me is a huge factor. Because I do feel like 
there needs to be uh, more recognition towards people of color who are being seen in more movies and not being seen behind the scenes, giving their perspective and their opinion on this movie. And, 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 and I want to make it very clear that I, I read a ton of white critics, and I think that's because I'm going to them because of their knowledge and because I do respect them. This is nothing against that. Of course not. We're not trying to tear down anyone else. We're just trying to bring a different Yeah, we gotta bring, we gotta up. bring, we gotta bring, because listen, like, we, when you're going back to like, you know, do you, or when I, when I mentioned like, do you think we're gonna be watching some strange foreign movies, you know, in, in the hood, like, and you know, a lot, and I've heard a lot of critics, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of shows that, you know, and, um, I remember uh, what the flake. You know, I don't know if they. If you, you, we've talked about what yeah. the flake before in the past. RIP. The channel's no longer in existence. Anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, RIP. Uh, but um, I remember one time they were discussing um, the whole article. There was a whole big like article that, or a big question that came up of whether or not um, critics should watch a certain number of movies to be crit you know considered a critic or whatever. And I remember one of the points that one of the hosts, the founders of Durati, made. I'm very, well, so, and I actually got to visit with the Flick Studios once too, which oh, was really cool. nice. It was very dope before they closed down. Um, but like he was, he, he has said, you know, um, like of course critics should have a certain number amount of movie knowledge because movies are so free and accessible. You go to the library and get them anywhere. And like, and I respect you know uh, Alfonso Durati very much, but I thought that was a little naive if you consider you know he grew you know. If you go to, what I'm saying is, if you go to the Compton Library, you're not finding any Jean Luc Godard films there. You're not finding any German expressionism. You're not finding any Soviet, you know, uh, realism. You're not getting any of that. <laughs> you're getting what they have, and what they have is jack shit. And, you know, like I said, garbage in, garbage out. If you're going to watch garbage your entire life, you're only going to be able to appreciate garbage or if you become if you want to become a filmmaker you're only gonna be able to make garbage you know what I mean so that's why always that's always my biggest problem is, is is that people don't understand the socio economic differences that different communities face that inhibit their film literacy from growing that inhibit them from having the same opportunities and it just and it always and there's always little examples like I remember watching an award show a couple years ago when Alexander Payne, I think he had won um, Best Adapted Screenplay for uh, uh, The Descendants or whatever. And I think his, his, his acceptance speech was like, and this is me, this was in 2011, 2012, so this is me as a kid from Compton watching at home. He, he goes on stage and he's like, oh yeah, and I would like to thank my, you know, and all respect to Alexander Payne, everything we did all episode, and all respect to everything he says, but he says, oh, thank you. Um, to the academy and thank you for my mom for allowing me to miss school and taking me to see uh, and taking me to the movies and to me like damn like that that kind of hurt me not hurt but I felt a certain kind of way about it because for one Compton doesn't even have a movie theater <laughs> Compton doesn't even have a movie theater yet uh, this dude is celebrating the fact that he got to miss high school and 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 I'm I'm going you know I'm you know and we're tr I'm tr literally just trying to make it by as a kid right like not barely you know trying to see as many movies as possible I used to movie out a lot that's how I saw movies I go to movies once a month been to watch like four or five of them join some one day you know yeah. um, but, like, um, but like as a, as a kid that was very frustrating because it was like that just shows no regard for the people who don't have that opportunity. And I guess I won't be winning the Oscar because my mom's not taking me to dish school to watch some weird French movies or whatever, you know? So I don't know. I think that's where the the discord has to be and, and we have to put more emphasis on the opportunities that people are allotted. And, and for me, I, I really want to make it clear that something that's happening now a lot, which is good, but not good in the same sense, is we're seeing a lot of people being called in for selective reviewing and that to me is something that shouldn't really take place crazy rich asians well let's get an asian guy to come in here uh a black panther let's get a black guy to come in here. that's cool and i respect that no i i, I know i know i'm just i'm not trying to call it me ace no no i'm not trying to call anyone out directly rb3 i'm kidding <laughs> because we see that happening a lot and i and i really want to make it clear that this is my point of view obviously it doesn't have to be yours but Let's have him in the room to begin with. Let's have him not review uh, uh, one month a year February movies or, or review only the Asian movies. Let's have him review all the movies. 
Let's have him in the room in the first place. Let's not just be like, oh, we got to bring my guy out because we're going to look bad. Because that's a selfish perspective. Why don't you have that black guy in there to begin with if he's that good? You should have that black guy in there to begin with to review the freaking Dunkirk or whatever other white-ass movie is in theater because that's the majority of movies are still white-ass movies. Why not? Because that to me is, is the true representation of diversity is not just bringing in people to look better but bringing in people to actually be on staff and actually be a writer, be a critic for a certain outlet and that's on the outlets. I'm calling on the outlets. I'm calling them out because for me it pisses me off when I see the outlets, the same outlets writing article after article about diversity and it's all bullshit because you still haven't hired one staff writer to be your critic or you still haven't even outsourced to these other art house films that aren't really, oh let's, I mean, who do we get to get Hereditary? Let's just get the same guy we always get. Why don't you get a Latino guy to review Hereditary? Why don't you get, like, it doesn't have to just be these types of movies, we have to get these types of people. And I feel like people are really, really missing the boat if they think that's diversity, because it isn't. You know, it's important to include them. I'm not saying it's not. It, it, it sh they should be included. But at the same time, they should have already been in there a long time ago. Yeah. And they should review every movie, not just the movies that you think we're going to look bad if we don't bring someone in who reaches that demographic. Okay. I mean, right. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's, that to me is like the biggest thing that kind of takes me back. Last thing I want to talk about RV3 before we finish up is um, the idea of YouTube reviews. Because full disclosure, that's kind of where we come from as yeah. far as our, our backgrounds go. Is is obviously the Schmoes know. I mean, all of us we we both met, you know, interning, no show. interning for the Schmoes No Show, no. who are film critics, and we see a lot nowadays. First, uh, first YouTube critics we start from. Yeah. There you go, and we're seeing nowadays of of these YouTube critics kind of take a lot of hold as far as people's perspectives. You know, they have they hold a lot of weight, um, but we kind of get the same ones <laughs> as far as demographic goes um 20 to 30 white dudes saying the same thing over and over about their favorite movies no offense against them i love every single one of them and i know quite a few of them um and i love them all to be honest and i respect a lot of their opinions but for me if we're going to start seeing it on a level like youtube a level that is very accessible to a lot of people you know, let's elevate other people who have different perspectives as well. You know, not just them, but others. To me, it's not necessarily about saying, don't listen to them, don't watch them, don't read their reviews, don't... The word don't doesn't exist for me. The word is do and do. The word is read those reviews, watch those reviews, get your perspective, and then do something else. Read a different perspective. Read someone else's reviews from a different demographic and a different background, so that can form your true relation to a movie because it's a relation it's an emotional connection towards a movie that you have that's the biggest thing that's going to come with a review is your connection towards a movie i don't know if you agree with that or not but that's just me my opinion no 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 i agree i agree um yeah no but uh youtube critics is definitely on a rise it is i think this has probably been one of the most meter uh, one of the biggest rises of, <laughs> of, of, of any form of criticism uh, that we've seen in the recent era. Um, we look at the, the other guys like Jeremy Johns, a uh, good buddy of ours too, Jeremy Johns. Uh, Jeremy Johns, Chris Stuckman, Stuckman, I know. Stuckman's um, a good guy, I know Stuckman. Yeah. Like these are all good people. Yeah, Black Nerd is dope. You watch Black Nerd? I've seen Black Nerd. Hey, yeah. there, that's my guy, that's my guy. But he, he be doing too much Ninja Turtles shit. <laughs> and I don't really fuck with Ninja Turtles, but I fuck with Black Nerds, so that's what's up. Um, yeah, there's, you know, we, we, I'm trying to think of how, what, what in our society has caused YouTube to blow up as big, because now obviously we used to have a lot of TV criticism. I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch a lot of, like, TV criticism. There was this channel called Real TV, Real TV. They had the Larry Malton show. By the way, Larry Malton follows me on Twitter. Hey, I was telling you earlier that I'm jealous, man. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I saw him at the live showdown, and I'm like, come on, man. You can't hey, follow me. <laughs> hey, Larry Malton, one of the OGs, also teaches at USC. Fight on, baby. Uh, I'm not in this class, but uh, I'm too scared to take this class because I'm scared. Like, uh, I don't like him anymore. Uh, but Malton on Movies, Richard Roper, all those guys, yeah. TV critics, TV critics, yeah. on screen, on video. And I remember those guys used to be tight. I remember that was my shit on TV, but 
once that channel kind of went away, and that's how I found Schmoes, by the way, too, was because I was watching Rose TV, and they used to have uh, not the top ten show that we know now, but a different top ten show on Reels that was not created by Schmoes, but Schmoes used to be featured on it, where they would count down top ten action scenes or top ten whatever, whatever, oh, cool. and sometimes the Schmoes would just be on there. Christian sure. Martin this is back two thousand eleven. You know what I mean? Um, but now YouTube is replacing that. Now YouTube, not a lot of people use cable anymore. That that channel yeah. basically doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, but everybody is, you know, on YouTube, and you know, we just saw Jeremy Johnson, a million subscribers recently, um, Chris Stuckman, um, as well, and hopefully the movie critic space is expanding on YouTube. They're starting to accept more movie critics on Rotten Tomatoes, YouTube critics on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, you know, you know, then we then it comes back into the question again of of qualifications, right? Are you not if, not necessarily qualifications, but do you have the same education, same knowledge of film that, let's say, Amy Nicholson has, or let's say, um, some other, who's another big like, critic right now? I don't know. McWeeny. Drew McWeeny, man. Good guy. He's a great critic. But you don't know, you don't well, know but, if they have the same amount of knowledge. Well, let's finish up by saying, so what, what are some of your favorite critics? Who are some of your favorite? Just um, on the spot, just one or two. I mean, I'm always going to say, like, Roger Ebert. I mean, we've read a bunch of his stuff, like, well, just current, throughout the history. Current. Oh, current? Um, R.I.P. though, but yeah. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still, you know, I still talk about Amy Nicholson a lot because I, yeah, I, I really like, like Amy Nicholson. I, I like the way she puts words together, and I also like, um, I like who's that homie on, um, you know, I, you know, I always read his reviews, and I, you know, I know he's a troll, but I always read Armand White's reviews, man. I always read his reviews, okay. man. Armand White. Maybe that's why I have so many spicy hot takes because Armand White is like the king of. Of trolling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm such a troll because I read all his reviews. But uh, see, that's a black guy. But see, Armand White, he's a black dude that we just can't claim. <laughs> we just can't claim Armand White. I don't man. think anyone wants to claim him. <laughs> we can't claim Armand White. Yeah. We can't claim him. But hey, man, he's funny as fuck. Um, who else? Um, I don't know. I've been getting real into um, some 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 of these online guys. I, I, I saw this video last night. Talking about um, Avengers: Infinity War um, by this dude named Film Joy, and he was talking about how much it sucked. <laughs> I hope you're joking, right? Now. I'm the one who told you about you that guy. <laughs> and I told you I like him a lot, uh, but his opinion is wrong. Right, he's right. <laughs> Straight up wrong. He's right, he's right. He's right. Uh, I always give a shout out to Alyssa Wilkinson from Vox. Mm. Uh, for anyone who knows what Vox is, it's a website, YouTube channel. Um, I think she gives a really interesting perspective. And the fact that she's like, yeah, she's dope. I just think she's dope. Amy Nicholson's another one. Oh, I also, like I mentioned, I found Zodorati before. I actually read all of his reviews too. Got and it. he's one of those critics that I very much appreciate because it's very clear what he thinks about a movie. And obviously, shout out to all the people we love. Um, yeah, of course, shout out. Christian Mark. Christian Mark. I was gonna say, like, you know. Alicia Malone, I love Alicia, and I love her opinions on stuff. Scott Mance. Um, people who are more into film Twitter than actual like film out critic outlets, like film Twitter people like Scott Mance, Alicia Malone, shout out to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen Yamato, Anji, Anji Han. Anji Yamato, yeah. um, those people are, are dope as well. And obviously we already mentioned all the YouTube critics that we actually know and they're kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, shout out to them too. Everybody's dope, everybody's dope. I just feel like there needs to be the same shift that's happening with diversifying in front of the camera should happen behind the camera, and the people creating the opinions of what is good and what is bad should be people with different perspectives. That's it. Well. All right, guys, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode of the Meeting of Podcasts. It's a little bit different than what we usually do. Next week, we'll be back with the same as usual, talking about different movies. For the Meaning of Podcast, I am Ace. It's RB3. And I gotta say, before we, before we do the official sign out, we gotta say thank you to all the fans for the 50th episode. This is a real milestone, man. This is a milestone. 50 episodes. Thank uh, you to the fans. Thank you to the I, fans. Of course, we love you guys. Yeah, I think I we're gonna make it past 12. Guys. I think we're gonna make it past 12. 12? I think we're gonna make it past 12. Really? You pay so. me that much, RB3? Nah, I, I thought we were either gonna get. Canceled. Oh, yeah. Or, and that, or, oh, at that point, yeah. yeah. We still might. <laughs> we still, hey, man. Salute to, uh, salute to Christian Harloff, Mike Ellis, and everybody at the Schmoes Know 
uh, network for giving us this platform on, yeah. on the iTunes feed. Uh, everybody at Collider Podcast too for letting us use the YouTube channel. Yeah, uh, shout course, out to the other Collider Podcasts. Uh, um, Witching Hour. Witching Hour. Shout right out to down. Alien Perry. Shout out yeah. to the Kuga and Fad. Yeah, TV, TV Talk, talk and, um, and, and, and and all the other programs. Riley Brown, one on one with Christian Harloff. I saw him with Tom yeah. Daniel. Um, salute to all of them. And also, um, thank you to all of our uh, fans that we've met in real life. Um, you said you met some at the Shmo Down Live. I met some at the Shmo Down Live too. Um, they've been nothing but great and actually give us a lot of words of encouragement. I remember having a good conversation with Kristen Smith. One time, too, from the Facebook group. Yeah, Kristen's awesome. She, 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 she's a good fan. And also, thank you to Brian Ward. And all, and all the fans who always pop up on our YouTube channel are great, too. Yeah, um, and Twitter. Bloom, Twitter. Twitter. Bloom, 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 Bloom's terrible. Tari. Uh, Tari. Um, um, uh, Laura, Alan, Alan Partridge. Yeah, Alan Partridge. Uh, Laura. Uh, Neil Varma. Guy Cole. Yeah, Laura. Um, Laura. 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 Laura.